Greetings, Embers, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you would like to learn how to become a member of the channel or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, those links can be found down below. As well, if you are new here and enjoy what you are hearing, or have been here and haven't done so already, please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Not only does it help the channel out, but it also reminds you of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is now time to go back to ashes, for once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Let's Not Meet Stories. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and ad will play, and after that there will be no more ads within this video. I was living in a flat share on the outskirts of a city, which is known for generally being very safe. A key is needed to enter the main building, but often the door isn't shut properly, and so doesn't lock. Not really a cause for concern for anyone in the building, as it's a very trusting neighborhood. It's around 2 a.m. and I'm laying in bed, naked, completely sprawled out. Someone opens my door and enters, I figured it's one of my flatmates going to the balcony. You have to walk through my room to access it, so it's completely normal that someone might come in at this time. I've just smoked a split and it's 2 a.m., so I opt to ignore him and pretend to be asleep. I can feel him standing there for about two minutes, I think. Maybe he's waiting for his girlfriend to join him, and maybe he's stood there checking his phone no big deal. He goes straight on to the balcony, takes about two or three minutes, so I figured it's definitely him. He's smoking a cigarette. He comes back in and goes back to standing in total silence, but I'm half asleep and don't really think about anything of it. The next morning, my flatmate tells me that someone broke in. Well, sauntered in, I suppose. Came into my room went into the room of my flatmate and rummaged through his things, went into the kitchen, and upon seeing my flatmate wake up and come to see what was going on, quickly exited the building. The only thing he stole was my pair of Marshall headphones. We were all very confused as to why they stole my headphones, as opposed to money left on the table or my flatmate's multiple cameras, for example. We spoke to our neighbors, of which they are around 15 in the building, and none of them had noticed anything out of the ordinary. They hadn't gone into any of our other apartments. We know that most of the neighbors also don't lock their doors at night, so it sounds as if they walked up three flights of stairs, ignored the other apartments, with the sole intention of coming to ours. And, given the stealth, it's unlikely that they were intoxicated and it was just a mistake. Nothing else came of it. The police said they'd keep an eye out, and I had to buy a new pair of headphones. But it left me thinking about what would have happened had I opened my eyes and alerted this person standing over me. Would they have hurt me? Would it be a total stranger or someone whom I've already met? My mom doesn't know this story, but how he noticed some special things made me realize what happened. I've always had the impression that creepy stories simply don't happen naturally. This changed the last few months. I live in a major avenue in a two-story house and at 3 a.m. Our house dog starts barking. My father and I woke up to see what is going on. There was nothing. Next week, again, this time, my brother and I, again, nothing. We started thinking that maybe the dog was just starting to hear things that happened in the avenue because it's a major thing. Most of the big reforms and even some services like tree cutting and gardening and some greens areas happened from 10 p.m. to 4 a.m. This happened a lot of times until it changed, and he started to bark to our kitchen door this time. 
I do hear metal scraping in the door. Just me because my mom is the only one on the first floor, side to the kitchen. Woke up to check what the hell was going on because he likes to chew trash at night. It stopped. I was half awakened, so no clear remembering. Started again to bark at the main door. We have a garage door between the main door and the street. Typical of Brazilian homes. I look at the garage and open the door. Again, nothing. I was bugged out that something was happening in the street. The garage door is completely shut. I can't see a thing or hear also. My mom one day in the mid of May said to me, the lock is strange. It's like something tried to force it open. I do keep this in mind until it happened in June. Came really late to home from a party. And when approaching home, I see someone with some metal things on the garage lock. I do scream something like, hey, and the person just starts running. I run to the door of the garage and shut it down. My dog is barking a lot. Now I know when he barks in the night, when nothing is happening, there is someone trying to enter the garage. I've started to suggest cameras. There is no ring thingies here. And maybe a sensor. My brother confessed that once he heard someone trying to enter the garage. Definitely, I do not want to meet the guy on the other side. Another night waking up with my dog barking at the garage, and now I know there's a guy or gal trying to force in way late into the night. Also, please forgive my English and storytelling as English is not my first language. Before I get into the story, there's a few things you need to know. First, I am an artist and have always been very in my own world. As it were, if I was thinking of a story or character or a picture, I wanted to draw. I'd walk into walls and forget anything anywhere and place items in weird places while I was thinking. To give you an idea the extent of this, my first place to look for anything I've lost is the fridge and freezer. I found remotes, my cell phone, art equipment, anything really, in the freezer or refrigerator. Second, I have always had a very negative view when it comes to alcohol or any other narcotics. I don't mean to shame any one of you that are listening to this, if you partake, but it was always something I just generally regarded as pointless. However, if you find enjoyment in it, all the better to you. Thirdly, I'm a very asexual person. I never desire sex or have any interest in finding a mate. So flirting usually flies over my head. And finally, due to my childhood, I have a mild case of anxiety disorder, which has lately been worse due to this event and escalated by other ones. This particular story begins when I graduate from an upper secondary school for visual arts. Upper secondary is the type of high school in Scandinavia. I had decent enough grades, my best being biology and English, and of course, art. I immediately looked for work after graduation since I had graduated half a year late because of some health issues and the entrance exams for universities were already done by the time I had graduated. So I had around one and a half years before even the possibility to apply for a university could happen. I would send hundreds of applications to any place that would take me and hardly ever got even invited for an interview. This took its toll on me, and I got depressed. I'd hardly leave the house, and I'd stop caring for myself altogether. I wouldn't shower, put on makeup, brush my teeth, nothing. I'd avoid mirrors, and I felt as though I was a complete and utter failure, which was not made any better by my parents who pressured me with, How many applications did you send today? Or, You really need to get this job so you can start saving to move out. This might sound mean, but they didn't mean it in a bad way. 
since I'd expressed the need to get my own flat for the past few years. Not to mention my relationship with my parents at the time was very strained, since my depression made me very irritable and angry. So I can't really blame them for pushing me to get out of the house. This continued for around half a year until I finally got a job in a hypermarket about eight miles away from the place I'd lived in. Life really picked up from there and I started to take care of myself once again. The people I worked with were all very, really nice people and I had no issues with anyone. Though they were very normal, so I'd get invited to get togethers or to have a pint after work, etc. I always made an excuse why I couldn't go and would play MMOs or something instead at home. This might sound sad, but I enjoyed myself more like that. Fast forward a year of working and I was accepted into my number one choice university. And due to this, I cut my work hours to half, so I was only at work for two to three nights a week. This particular hypermarket chain I worked at had a yearly festival week gimmick to boost sales, and this year we were handed scratch cards to sell during the catching out process. Apparently, the chain had a contest within every location, and the winning hypermarket would be giving a $1,000 e-cash price for employee refreshment purposes, and that means booze. Our hypermarket decided we'd take everyone out for the night drinking in a hotel and resort area connected to the shopping mall our workplace was with the money. No surprise there. And since I had grown close friends with many of the other cashiers, I was motivated to win, even if I usually didn't enjoy going out. Everyone in the department was so excited for it. It was kind of infectious. Long story short, we won the competition and we went drinking. Our boss was so pleased with how well we did and how motivated we were, he even opened us a tab in the first bar we went to, so I had quite a bit to drink as well. When the first bar closed down, we went, on our own money, to continue into a nearby nightclub. I hardly remember anything else than that I drank like a sailor and sang karaoke horribly. We stayed until closing time, and I made my way to the train station to catch the last train home. On my way, I was stopped by a man with a thick accent who asked if he could walk me home. I laughed and just said that no worries. I was literally a few steps away and motioning towards the station. He then apologized and said he thought I lived in the student buildings nearby and went on his way. I thought that was quite an endearing way to ask someone out and thought nothing more of it. Another year passes by and I'm now living alone in a student block not far from my parents' home. The area I moved to was very poor since it consisted only of students, so in a weird way I actually felt very safe living there. The walls were thin as paper, so everyone would hear if something happened to me, or if anyone tried to break into my home, etc. Granted, I got an email from the company that funded the cheap student blocks that the bike seller in your address was broken into, but I never kept anything in there, so it really didn't faze me. Sometimes I'd even forget my keys on the lock in the front door and wake up in the morning to a neighbor ringing my doorbell and handing me my keys with a joking, <laughs> nothing to steal, eh? There also was a very convenient bus that stopped right outside my door that I could take for both school and work, though I needed another bus to get all the way to work. One Saturday, after a nine-hour shift at work, I heard someone call out to me through my earphones. I always stopped if I heard someone call out when I was near work, since it usually was a colleague offering a lift or a regular customer wanting to crack a joke, or one of the guys from a GameStop upstairs wanting to talk about Skyrim or something. I was basically friends with nearly every employee in the mall, so someone stopping me late at night in a sketchy parking lot or underpass was very common. I didn't recognize the man. But then again, I handled around 600 customers every day, so I 
hardly ever did. I also was conditioned to flash a bright smile through years of customer service whenever I met someone's eyes, even outside of work. I'm sure the ones who've worked in customer service jobs for so long can relate to this. The man spoke hurriedly in a thick accent about how he was in love with me and how he had been watching me. It was very hard to make sense of anything he was saying. It was a stream of consciousness kind of thing, how he spoke. What I did make out was that he had seen me in a bar, which he named, and ever since he had been watching me and never before found the courage to talk to me until now. I was unsettled by the choice of words, but I chucked it to him not being a native speaker. I listened to him while I nervously eyed the underpass, feeling glad that there were a few people walking through it during this whole spiel. After he quieted down, I just awkwardly said, <laughs> Okay, uh, thanks, but I need to go or I'll miss my bus, and turned to continue on. When he grabbed me and pushed me back towards the walls of the underpass, I was around 30 centimeters taller than him, and he had a lot of mass over me. Since the most sports I had ever done was acrobatics and ballet, and I even quit that years ago. I considered punching him or screaming, but I felt it better not to escalate the situation, so I sternly told him to let me go and then I needed to get to the station. He pleaded for me to give him a chance and said he wouldn't let me go before I did. I was racking my brain about the safest way out of this situation, so I tentatively told him, what if I save your number and I'll see if I call you? I had used this on other persistent suitors before and it had worked just fine. Now I wished I'd never uttered those words. The man's face lit up and he started to spell out his name, as he was somewhere from the Middle East. While I pulled out my phone and hammered his name and number into my phone, sighing in relief, I was almost safely back at my home. And suddenly, he grabbed my hand and tore my phone from my hands. At this point, I angrily screamed at him. What in the hell are you doing? Give me back my phone. But to my horror, everyone had moved on from the underpass and I was alone with this creeper. And he ignored me struggling and screaming completely and calmly just called his own phone number with it before handing it back to me as if what he just did was completely normal. I stared at him, terrified and dumbfounded. He then hugged me tight, cupping a feel and tried to kiss me. I hurriedly blocked his mouth with my hands and forcibly pushed him away. I don't say anything anymore and just run out from under the underpass. And he didn't try to stop me. When I was safely at home, I blocked his number first and then deleted it thinking any deity possible that when I moved out and got my new phone, my father had insisted on an enlisted one, so he couldn't just find my address out by Google. I asked my manager to not give me the Saturday night shift for a while and explain my problem to her. I also asked if he could be banned from the store or something, but she told me she couldn't do anything before I filed a restraining order. Obviously, I had no idea what the man's name or number was anymore, not to mention getting a restraining order on him based on what I had as evidence. It was very unlikely. A few weeks went by, and he showed up when I was at work without fail, as if he knew my shift, even though I had a different shift every week. He'd just stare at me from outside the shop or buy a single lollipop or something else cheap multiple times a day, paying with cash, so I had to extend my hand out to him, which he always took and held for as long as there was no customer there. The horrible thing about this was, it was not unusual to get a creeper customer every so often. Every now and then you'd get them if you worked as a cashier, mentally ill or just socially inept, Desperate people mistake customer service as genuine interest painfully often, 
and you'd hardly pay any more attention to it than the other customers, since nearly always it's a short-term thing and kinda harmless. Basically, this man could have been stalking me for God knows how long, and I just hadn't noticed. The thought that I only noticed this now, that I had that earlier encounter with him, was enough for me to lose sleep over and get a reoccurring sleep paralysis nightmare of someone entering my room and breathing heavily in my ear as a result. This went on, and it was now a few days until my four weeks of paid and four weeks of unpaid summer vacation I had requested and given. The thought of not having to go to work and face that man every day was enough to perk me up, so I threw myself into an extracurricular school project, a game of a museum's exhibit. One day I had stayed at school working on a 2D rig for said project until school was closing and the janitor ushered me out of the classroom. I had a little while before my bus was due to arrive at the stop, so I decided to catch some fresh air after working nearly 12 hours on the computer and walk to the nearby station that was at the end of the line. The bus was already waiting, so I rushed in, and after I paid the fee and faced the back of the bus, my stomach turned. There he was with three friends, the guy with the thick accent, my stalker. We were the only passengers. I thought about getting off the bus, but the next one wouldn't be for an hour or so. Against all common sense, I decided to stay on. I sat on the very front of the car, hoping he would not notice me. But as soon as the bus left the station, he moved to sit next to me, and his friends moved to sit behind me. As if they knew this was the line I took usually and just waited so I couldn't exit the bus. I was ready to throw up. I turned my music so loud in my ears it hurt. I ignored every tap and shoulder grab. I clenched my laptop back on my lap, ready to sacrifice my computer and smack him in the face with it if he tried to do anything else. Then the realization hit me. This line stopped literally on the front door of my building. My name was plastered on the front of the building. He would know where I lived. I felt as if I could burst into a howling cry any moment now. My thoughts were going a mile a minute, considering everything that could happen to me if I didn't have a way to get out of this situation. I knew there was a longer stop coming up later, so I decided to try to make my break there. When the stop rolled around, my heart pounding, I said, music still breaking my eardrums, sorry, I need to get off of here, and made my way to the mid doors. All four men followed me, speaking fast in Hebrew. When the doors opened, I stepped out and walk a while before suddenly turning back and running like I was possessed back into the bus and yelling at the driver. Drive, just go please, please, please. The driver looked taken aback, looked at the men who were running toward the bus and back at my face, twisted into loud sobs and how I was shaking, and he decided I was serious. He closed the doors and sped off. He stopped the bus at a garage a few miles away, asking if he could do anything, call the cops or something. I just kept sobbing and recanted my first encounter to him when something in my head clicked. The bar. He had specifically named it. It was the nightclub we went to to continue our drinking over a year ago when we won the contest. I never before or after had visited that nightclub. He said he saw me there. He had been telling me over a year. That night, he was the one who offered to walk me home. That's why he showed up at my work without fail whenever I was working. I sobbed, howled like a damn tortured cat at that, and the driver told me to go lie down in the back and that he'd drive me home. And I told him it was the last stop. The driver dropped me safely home before he continued his round, 
risking his job for my safety. I cannot thank him enough, and I don't even know his name. After this second incident, I called in to work sick until my vacation and cut off my hair and dyed it black. I also only spent the vacation biking around my hometown during the day, staying out from the town my work and school was in for the whole two months. I occasionally still sometimes have those deep sleep paralysis nightmares, but I never saw him again. A small part of me thinks it's because he doesn't want me to. One thing is for sure though, I never left my keys in my lock again. So, to the man with the thick accent, let's never meet again. This takes place in the rural farmland of the southeastern United States. For those from around the area, you will know that there isn't much around except for old farmhouses, fields, and the occasional subdivision. When I was around 17 or 18, I was dating a girl who went to the same high school as me. Being teenagers, we needed a place to be alone, and what better than the front seat of my F-150? Often it was hard to find a place to park that was away from the road and was far enough away from everyone else. One evening, as the sun was getting ready to set, I remembered an abandoned house with a long driveway and a tobacco barn off some old back road with no houses. I had been there before and explored the property. The house's roof had been abandoned long ago and currently had been used to store lumber. The house had no doors or windows left and the rest of the property was clearly in disrepair and didn't appear to be used at all. I figured this long-forgotten property would make a good spot, so I drove my truck up into the driveway, far away from prying eyes. I put my truck in park, lifted up my center console, and put on the radio. As my girlfriend and I were talking, she suddenly stops with her eyes glued to the rearview mirror and says, Um, I think someone is here? I initially blew her off as... I was fairly confident no one was around for miles, but I glanced in my rearview mirror to see a very beat up looking Ford truck had pulled directly behind me and the door flew open. Out jumped a tall, dirty looking man holding what appeared to be a 30.06 with a weathered wooden stock. As I put my windows down, the man advances yelling all types of obscenities from the side of my truck as he walks up, I heard the distinct sound of the safety clicking off of an older rifle. I froze as the world stopped around me. I had never been held at gunpoint before. As soon as the shock wore off, I threw my hands up and I see the man had his sights aimed on me through the rear window of my truck. I look over to my girlfriend who was frozen in shock and somewhat cowered in the passenger door. I remember feeling helpless and reaching for my pistol I usually had between the seats, which I quickly realized I had left at home. This was probably a blessing in disguise as the strange man was clearly belligerent and under the influence of something. I'm sure him seeing my pistol would have just sent him more over the edge. As my hands are up and my girlfriend is shaking in fear, I eventually mutter out, What's going on, sir? The man, through rotten and missing teeth, shouts, You sons of bitches come out here tearing up my field and ruining my crops. He clearly had mistaken me for some of the ATB riders around the area who would often wander onto private property and tear up the land. Looking at the man, he didn't look like any of the farmers I had known around the area, having lived here 15 years at this point. I was fairly familiar with the local farmers. This supposed farmer looked maybe in his 30s and looked to me more like the junkies I would see downtown. 
I replied to the man that I had never been here before, nor that I was responsible for destroying his crops, just trying desperately to defuse the situation. He wanted to hear none of it and continued to mutter while still holding me at gunpoint. I waited for a break in his incoherent babbling to apologize profusely and say, Sir, if I had seen a no trespassing sign, I, I wouldn't have dared step foot on the property. The man advanced from behind my truck to my open window to yell, Didn't you see the fucking sign? He didn't believe me. As I studied him, he continued to grip the rifle tighter and mumbled to himself. I apologized some more and offered to leave when I noticed he has me completely blocked in. There's nowhere to go. As soon as I mentioned leaving, he perked up and dropped the rifle ever so slightly, putting us out of immediate danger. My fight or flight briefly chose fight but I knew there was no way to jump out of the truck and get to him before he could shoot. Time seemed to slow, and I felt like the silence that ensued lasted hours. He started to yell obscenities again, but started to walk back to his own truck. As he passes my rear bumper, my girlfriend and I exchanged glances. I had never seen a fear like that in someone's eyes, let alone someone I loved. I knew I had to do whatever I could to get away from this unhinged stranger. I fired up my truck and put it in reverse as he does the same. The beat up Ford backed into the road and stopped, waiting for me to exit. I backed into the road as well, my eyes never leaving the rear view mirror. As soon as there was enough space, I threw the truck in the drive and stomped the gas pedal down as far as it would go. My tires squealed and the truck roared as it ran through the gears. I was familiar with the roads and was confident I could outrun him if need be, as his truck looked like it was on its last leg anyway. As the speedometer flew past 60, I could see the man following us, but enough distance for my truck it wouldn't be hard to put a hole in my tailgate. My girlfriend is calming down at this point and is trying to rationalize what just happened. I drove and drove for several miles constantly looking behind to me to see if he was still following. I briefly remember doing over 100 miles an hour at some point. The mood in the cab changed to utter disbelief as we talked about how crazy the supposed farmer looked and awkwardly laughing off our near deaths. I never saw that man again, after and never returned to that abandoned house, except for the next day to leave him some ruts in the front yard of the rundown property. Looking back, I haven't the slightest idea as to how the man knew we were there, as we weren't visible from the road, nor were we followed. I personally think he was just some tweaker, as I knew most all of the farmers in the area. And being in a small town, you knew everybody. I had never seen this man in my life, nor have I seen him since. I certainly was in the wrong being on private property, and have heard horror stories of people running from crazed farmers as bullets flew over their heads. However, a couple of kids parked in what was clearly a forgotten property, several hundred yards from the nearest field, shouldn't have warranted a firearm pointed at me and my girlfriend, who was sitting in a clean truck that obviously hadn't been tearing up any fields. Coming from a farming family and being close with the farmers in the area, the last thing you would catch me doing is tearing up someone's livelihood. Regardless, I put my girlfriend's and my life at stake just to park up somewhere and fool around. I never made that mistake again. So, to the creepy tweaker or farmer, I hope I never see you again. In June of this year, I moved out of my parents' apartment as I finally got a steady job and longed for some sort of freedom. 
I looked for apartments that were affordable in my city and found one that's a two or three minute walk from my parents' apartment. To me, it was perfect. I'd get to live alone and my parents were still nearby so I could visit them whenever I wanted to or pop in to have some breakfast. The apartment itself is great. It's not really much to look at, but for a single male, it was more than enough. My apartment has a long corridor connecting each room together from the sides, with my front door being at the start of the corridor. My bedroom is the second room on the left, but since the walls were pretty thin, you can literally hear people in the apartment complex, walking, talking, and etc. From my bedroom, and any room for that matter, Last week, I came home from the pub after meeting up with a few friends. It wasn't really late. It was probably 10.15 or 10.30ish. And I had the day off, so I took a shower and hopped into bed to watch Netflix. It was probably around midnight, I think, when I heard a faint knock coming from the front door. I stopped the show that I was watching and listened for a minute and just thought that it was my mind playing tricks on me. I continued watching Netflix when once again I heard a two-motion knock on my door. I sat up from my bed, went to the door, and looked through the peephole, and sure enough, it was pitch black. I once again shrugged it off and went back to my room, but before I could even sit down properly, I heard a slightly louder knock-knock. At this point, I thought it was my friend playing a prank on me, so I called my friend and asked if he was knocking on my door. And if he was, it was not amusing. He paused for a second and said, Uh, dude, I'm at home. I have to be up at like 7.30. I believed him and hung up the phone. I was talking pretty loudly, so whoever was knocking probably heard me. And as soon as I hung up, I heard another knock. At this point, I was pretty pissed off, so I walked to the door, looked through the peephole, and saw nothing. I then unlocked the door, took a peek, and closed the door, and locked it. Me being angry and a bit intoxicated, I decided to wait and catch whoever was knocking. So I spent a solid ten minutes silently looking through the peephole, before being a bit startled as someone put their hand over the peephole and knocked. I immediately started unlocking the door and ran out to the apartment hall. I heard something booking it down the steps and heard him, supposedly, lean against the wall as his jacket shrugged the wall. So I ran a few steps down before realizing that whoever this is was waiting behind the corner to get the jump on me. I hurried back inside and called the cops. They were there within a few minutes and scanned the building and the street, but couldn't find anyone. They told me that it could just be some kids pulling a prank and to never run after someone. They kept a patrol car around the entire night and the knocking stopped. It could have just been some kids being dumb, but the part that gave me the freaking creeps was the fact that whoever it was ran down the stairs and stopped behind the corner. He didn't keep running. If it were some pranksters, I find it more likely that they would have just booked it outside, you know? As I said, it's been a week and the knocking stopped. It kept me on edge for a few days because I just expected to be jumped by someone when walking into my apartment. But so far, nothing has come of it. I'll let it go at the moment and just hope that it won't happen again. I moved in with my elderly grandmother a few months ago because I got a new job down the street from her house and she said she'd be happy to have me stay with her. Here's some context. I used to come visit my grandmother about one weekend a month. About a year ago, while I was visiting, one of her neighbors, a couple houses down, came to talk to us while we were sitting on the front porch. She informed us that the adult son of the man who lived across the street from them was mentally ill and a peeping Tom. 
Supposedly, he would come stand in this neighbor's yard and just stare into her windows. She got her husband to yell at him, and when he kept doing it, they eventually called the cops. My grandmother remarked that she had seen the cops at this man's house for years, and that supposedly a single dad lived there with his adult son who struggled to manage his mental problems. Flash forward to a couple weeks ago, now living with my grandmother full time. I got home after dark a few weeks ago and the front door was cracked open. My grandmother is a bit of a safety freak, so she always has her doors locked. I was nervous, but tried to hope for the best thinking my grandmother had forgotten to close the door on the way in with groceries. I go to her room and she said she was certain she had locked that door. I tried not to worry about it since nothing had been moved or stolen. The next day when I got home, her car was cracked open. At this point I assumed both instances were her and that she was just getting forgetful. However, she's never left either of these things open or unlocked before. Well, tonight, my grandmother and I go out for dinner, and therefore, I am the one who locked the front door on the way out. She has a doorknob lock and a deadbolt lock above it. I distinctly remember struggling to lock the deadbolt. They both use the same key. Sometimes you have to shimmy the door to get the deadbolt to lock. But I got sick of trying and just left it unlocked satisfied with the doorbell being locked. Funnily enough, as I walked away from the door, I thought to myself, I hope no one breaks in. Well, we get back from dinner and I go to unlock the doorknob and to my surprise, the door wouldn't open because the deadbolt had somehow been locked. It was in that moment I immediately knew someone had been in the house while we were gone and locked the deadbolt back when they left. Once again, nothing had been moved or stolen. The creepy part is that this person is intentionally leaving the doors open and locking back locks that had not been locked on purpose just to creep us out. And he was obviously watching us out of his windows to see when we left tonight. I feel certain that this is this mentally ill man who must have gotten a hold of a key that my grandmother hid under a mat or something. Why would anyone else do this? If it was a robber, they would have taken something. Reminds me of the first season of American Horror Story where Jessica Lane's autistic daughter would just randomly sneak into Connie Britton's house. I'm just hoping that if it is this guy down the street, that he is as harmless as that AHS character. I've never laid eyes on this mentally ill neighbor before, so let's not meet, man. I'm going to get the locks changed as soon as possible and install a ring doorbell camera. What I'm most nervous about is that once I get the locks changed, this guy, or whoever it is, will know we're onto them and may get mad because they won't get access to their twisted pastime anymore. We live in a gun-friendly state, although we don't own any, but I'm afraid of what this guy may do in retaliation. The neighbor who had the peeping Tom incident literally called the cops on him, and she's still alive, so I just hope he leaves us alone and doesn't bother us anymore. Do you all agree that most signs point to the creeper down the street as the culprit? What would you do in this situation. I'm still pretty jarred from this experience, but I figured it would be easier to share it than keep dwelling on it. A couple of days ago, someone broke into my house while I was asleep. I work night shift, so sleeping during the day is something you learn to get used to. Around 6.30 p.m., I heard, what I thought was, a loud knocking sound coming from outside, and my dogs going absolutely ballistic. For reference, I live on a farm out in the middle of nowhere. 
My closest neighbor is a half a mile away. But back to the story. I, somewhat, wake up but don't really think anything of it since my neighbors like to shoot their guns and this was during hunting season. As I start falling back asleep, my heart started fluttering weird, like I knew something wasn't right. That's when I heard loud footsteps throughout the house. The dogs are still barking, but start to quiet down. That's when I really began to worry. When I think of my dogs protecting me in a place and time like this, <laughs> fat chance. The footsteps stop on the other side of the bedroom door and doesn't move. I think this is how I'm going to die, and although I had a weapon in my room, I knew I couldn't get it without being heard. It felt like an eternity before the steps moved around and moved towards my brother's room. Rustling can be heard loudly through the house and things being thrown. I knew they were in my brother's room. Some of his friends are into seedy situations, and I knew it had to be one of them. I heard the footsteps coming back to my door, and the doorknob handle moves. I immediately turned my back towards the door and closed my eyes tight, a hand over my mouth to stop from screaming. The door opens, but that's it. Then, he leaves as a car drives down the road. I finally bucked up my courage and get out of bed. Everything in the house except for my brother's room was undisturbed. I immediately called my brother and asked if any of his friends were coming over. He said not that he knew of and I told him what happened. He got off the phone with me to start calling around. I went back to bed and noticed that I still had my window cracked over from earlier and realized I had my sheet off of me, wearing only a t-shirt to bed. If it was who I think it was, this wasn't a random event. One of my brother's friends has always had eyes for me, and the fact that he saw me sleeping and in just a t-shirt makes me freak out. Whether or not he took something out of my brother's room or knew I was home alone sleeping before having to go to work later that night, I don't know. I'll post an update when I hear from my brother. You move out to the country to get away from the activity of city life and let your guard down. That's when something like this happens. Sometimes country life isn't so safe after all. So, this just happened bit of a background of the last 25 minutes. I just got home from a reasonably big night. It's 4.30 a.m. and stinking hot in this part of Australia right now. I walked in the door and opened the fridge and was so happy to find three icy cold beers in the fridge. I take two of them and walk upstairs to bed to read and drink myself into a boozy sleep. First issue. The beers are not twist tops. They need a bottle opener. And after some sloppy, drunken attempts at using the handle off the drawer of my bedside table, I head back downstairs to use an actual bottle opener. I turn on the kitchen lights, which are so bright that they make the space between my eyes burn. I squinted around to find the bottle opener, which I can't find. So I use the solid edge of a large kitchen knife. It's a risky choice, but the bottle cap is now off the beer. And I'm happy. I turn off the alien blinding kitchen light and go to head upstairs. But something through the front window of my house that looks onto the street catches my eye. I stop at the bottom of the stairs and all the hairs on the back of my neck and arms stand up. I turn my head slowly, and my eyes and brain are trying to make sense of what I'm looking at. It looks like a rain-drenched woman in a fancy white dress gazing at me through the window. Oh fuck, it actually is. I pause and take the longest inhale of my life. She's glaring at me like she hates me, 
She has mascara running down her face and she is drenched from the rain. Her arms are extended and she's leaning her head towards me like her body language was trying to say, Look at me. Look at what you've done. I'm shitting bricks. But the rational side of my brain kicks in and I think, Shit, is she okay? Does she need help? I slowly walk over to the window, her gaze still locked onto mine. We are now literally within one meter of each other. I state loudly through the glass, Are you okay? Do you need help? Is anyone with you? Then it dawns on me. My gate is locked and there is an eight foot high fence which is very difficult to climb. How the hell did she get in? She doesn't respond to my inquiry. She just keeps that hateful look in her eyes. We stood there for about 30 seconds. I was looking around nervously, trying to make sense of this, and she was just glaring into my soul. And then she finally opened her mouth as if to say something, finally. But it wasn't words that came out of her mouth. It was an insanely high-pitched, meow. And then she starts clawing at the window with her novelty-sized fingernails. What in the actual fuck, man? I'm frozen. I don't know what to do. She's clearly not very well. Not very well at all. Then, in the background behind the fence, I see another woman, 20-something, dressed in a short black club dress with the glow of her phone lighting up her face. She sees the woman in white at my window and yells, Michelle, you pissed bitch, that's the wrong fucking house. The rain-soaked nightmare Catwoman's eyes go from I hate you and want you to die to Oh my God, I'm so sorry and embarrassed. And she runs over to the fence and impressively army commando flings herself over it. I can then hear a group of ladies pissing themselves laughing, saying out, Jason's house is number 25, not 23, you fucking idiot. That poor guy is probably going to call the cops now. All I know is that I am so happy that I was on the receiving end of a misdirected prank and I didn't have to be killed by a well-dressed hybrid cat demon woman. And now I have to go back down to the kitchen to open my other beer. But I'm still too afraid. Crazy cat lady, I hope I never see you again. This happened in July, I believe. It was around 1 a.m., and it was still about 80 degrees Fahrenheit outside. And where I live, AC isn't very common, so I, a 22-year-old female, was sitting in the living room with all the windows and doors open. I head out to smoke, and since everything was open and I didn't want the house to smell like smoke, I walked down the driveway and sat on the curb. There was a man standing on the same side of the street, but a block down, just staring at me. And I got really uncomfortable, so I got up and crossed the road. The way my triplex is set up is there is a three-car driveway, then a few stairs up that lead into the yard, and then my door to the right, my neighbor straight ahead, and some more stairs to my other neighbors upstairs. I live somewhere with a lot of homeless people and they'll come up the driveway to look in our trash cans or whatever and that's fine. They never go past the steps. So I'm standing on the other side of the road and I watch the man stand and stare at me. And then he proceeds to walk all the way into my yard and I start to panic because I didn't lock my door and all the windows were open. So I start to walk down the street and I see a man who looks normal and I stop him and ask if he could just pretend to know me. In retrospect, this wasn't my brightest decision, but whatever. So me and this man are standing there just talking and I'm explaining the situation and we're both just smoking a cigarette and we're looking at my house. I'm a few houses down now. 
and the man keeps peeking around the line of trees next to my place. He peeks around the corner a few more times and eventually walks up to me. I'm scared shitless and I'm shaking and he asks me for a cigarette and I go to hand him one and he goes, why are you shaking? Are you scared? And I was just like, uh, nope, have a great night. He walks away and the other dude stands there for a little bit longer with me. And the scary man starts peeking around another corner, just staring at me again. The dude walks me to my house, and I just shut all the windows and doors, and I just dealt with the heat. I'm grateful for the random dude, and don't know what I would have done if he wasn't there. So, creepy homeless person, I'm glad you didn't get into my place, and I hope we never meet again. I'm not a native English speaker, so I'm sorry if there's any errors that don't make sense in this story. To put it into context, I live in a rural area and I need to take almost two hours by bus to get to the city where I go to college. On one of those days on the way home, I was just sitting in my corner on the bus listening to music on my headphones. I usually even sleep because it's kind of far away. Anyway. We were on the route when in the distance we saw a woman on the road signaling for a ride, which was already a bit strange because in my country we don't have this culture of giving rides to strangers. Almost nobody does that. Even so, the bus stopped and she got on. She must have been 42 years old. As soon as she got on, the first thing that all of us on the bus, this bus is only for students, noticed was the smell. She had a strong smell of chemicals, like acetone or alcohol, something like that. Her hair was also soaked with something. She asked the driver where he was going. He replied, from what I understand, she wanted to stay at a destination further away than our city, but she was going to take a ride there. Although this seemed like a normal dialogue, she spoke in a strange way. It seems like she was in a big hurry to get there quickly. She had several empty chairs, but she sat right next to me, and that was really weird. From then on, I spent one hour of much, much tension until I arrived at my house. The unbearable smell of chemicals was very uncomfortable. I wondered where it was coming from, she was carrying a bag, and inside there were several glass jars with liquids inside. I imagined it was from there. The stew on her head was hair bleach. And if you've ever bleached your hair in your life, you know that after a while it starts to burn a lot, and given the redness, I think it was on fire. At some point, I did something that I later regretted. Out of politeness, I looked at her and smiled. When I did this, the woman, who was sitting next to me, in other words, extremely close, started looking at me very angrily, without blinking, for a long time. When I say a long time, I'm telling you that she didn't take her eyes off my face for a second, even though I was visibly uncomfortable. Everyone on the bus was looking at it because it was fucking weird. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that she stayed like that until we arrived in my city and she came down. I thank God when she left. I really thought, at some point, she was going to throw some liquid like that at me. Everyone on the bus was commenting how bizarre it was. So, to the chemical-soaked lady, I pray for your safety, but I hope I never meet you again. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true Let's Not Meet stories. I'd like to take a moment and thank the reformed members of the channel. 
Inner Scare Wifey, Howler's Mom, Luz Crispin, Tammy Slayton, C.A.G., Denise Sess, Samantha Plague, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Norman D.W., Christy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's Niece. Thank you so much for your continued support. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this selection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll read to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.